I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly out of the hospital. Pope Francis is back at the Vatican after recovering from surgery. We have a report from Rome. Threat from Beijing. How the U.S. Secretary of State is preparing for an important meeting with China. Wins and losses. Analysis of the Los Angeles Dodgers and their decision to honor a transgender group that mocks Catholics and stating their case. A closer look at which parts of the U.S. are the best and worst when it comes to religious freedom. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Solemnity of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Our top story tonight, Pope Francis is back at the Vatican. The Holy Father left the Gemelli Hospital this morning, eight days after his abdominal surgery. He is set to resume at least part of his normal schedule on Sunday. EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief Andreas Tonhauser has more. Pope Francis has recovered well. Earlier today, the Holy Father was finally able to leave the famous Gemelli Clinic, where he spent the last 10 days after an abdominal surgery. I'm alive, he said jokingly to the faithful waiting outside the clinic. They greeted a smiling Pope Francis, still of course in a wheelchair, but looking quite healthy and relaxed. As has become a custom with Pope Francis, he did not go straight back to the Vatican, but instead visited Santa Maria Maggiore and spent time in prayer in front of the image of Our Lady. This coming Sunday, the Pope will already pray again the Angelus together with the faithful gathered in St. Peter's Square. All appointments scheduled for the coming days are also confirmed. Only the general audience will be paused for at least another week. The Vatican Press Office has also stated that all apostolic trips, including the one to the World Youth Day to Lisbon in August, are still on. The surgeon attending to the Holy Father said in front of the journalists, The Pope is fine, you have seen him, you have talked to him, he has to rest now like everyone else. He's going to do that in his apartment in Santa Marta. But Pope Francis has already resumed work, even from the hospital bed. As for the Pope's upcoming trips and engagements, the doctors also added that the Pope will be able to face them better than before because, and I quote, he no longer has the discomforts he had before. He will be a stronger Pope. Another Gemelli patient is also healthy, namely Michelangelo, the baby who Pope Francis baptized at the Gemelli Clinic when he was there back in March. The young boy visited our Vatican Bureau this week, and just like the Pope, he's alive and well. In Rome, Andreas Tonhauser, EWTN News Nightly. Our millions of borrowers may soon learn whether they could receive up to $20,000 in debt relief under President Joe Biden's student loan forgiveness program. The fate of the unprecedented program lies with the U.S. Supreme Court. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has the latest. Tracy, the justices are expected to rule soon on whether to uphold or strike down the proposal that was first introduced by President Biden back in August. The real issue is whether the executive branch can spend a half a trillion dollars without any congressional oversight. But the president just can't choose to spend billions and billions of, of taxpayer dollars uh, without going through the congressional experience. This is not about student loans. This is about what does the United States Constitution say? But Democrats tell me it's necessary for young people to get a good start. I think uh, that at a time when you've got 45 million people struggling, I think it's time to cancel all student debt uh, in this country. Others say it's not fair to those who have found ways to pay for their college education. As a medical student myself, I had the choice of joining the Army Reserve or borrowing money. I chose to join the Army Reserve, so no one thinks this is fair. Senator Tommy Tuberville, a former football coach, tells me it's devastating that universities have turned into money machines, partially funded by the federal government. And again, I worked for 35 years in college, and I've seen them grow. I've seen tuitions skyrocket. I've seen loans given out that... A lot of people never even went to class. They took loans and ended up putting on a house or buying a car, and they don't pay them back. Critics also warn that the student loan forgiveness program could lead to tuition increases. A decision is expected very soon. Outside the U.S. Supreme Court, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Well, it has been one year since President Joe Biden signed the bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Today, he traveled to West Hartford, Connecticut to mark the anniversary. The president is pushing for gun control since firearms are the number one killer of children in the U.S. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. 
Tracy, despite President Joe Biden signing that bill last year, gun violence continues to claim lives across the country. According to the Associated Press, which is keeping track of the numbers, very grim numbers, there have been 26 mass killings in the U.S. so far in 2023. In addition to that, hundreds of children have lost their lives due to gunfire. President Joe Biden makes the call for more action to tackle gun violence. Folks, it's time once again that we banned AR-15 rifle style weapons. Last year's law was signed just weeks after a mass shooting that killed 19 elementary school children and two teachers in Texas. The law toughened background checks for the youngest gun buyers, and millions of new dollars have flowed in the mental health services for children and schools. It includes an additional 14,000 mental health professionals hired and trained to work in our schools. Meanwhile, meeting with China. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is traveling to Beijing to try to repair relations. He canceled his last trip after China floated a spy balloon over the U.S. Also, China now denies it was behind a widespread global computer hack. And speaking of computers, Microsoft founder Bill Gates just met with Chinese leader Xi Jinping. The communist country, which is accused of committing genocide against the Uyghurs, is using the visit to try to attract investors. Tonight, the president heads to a campaign fundraiser in Greenwich, Connecticut. And then tomorrow, he visits Philadelphia's convention center for the first political rally of his re-election campaign. The president is counting on union labor support to win in 2024. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Well, the chief executive officer of EWTN says the decision by a Major League Baseball team to honor a transgender group that mocks Catholics calls for something stronger than a boycott. In a publisher's note, Michael Warsaw writes in part, quote, the Catholic faith offers hope, belonging, forgiveness, love, and happiness more than any embrace of pride ever could. This is what we want the Dodgers and the world to see. The Los Angeles Dodgers rescinded their initial invitation to the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence following pushback from fans. Not long after, the team not only re-invited the group, it also offered an apology. The ceremony is scheduled for tonight as part of the game against the San Francisco Giants. And we go now to sports agent Doug Eldridge, founder of DLE Agency and Achilles Public Relations. Doug, great to have you back on. A, a lot to get to. Uh, but first... From a public relations perspective, how do you think the Dodgers handle this situation? And what are the benefits and the cost to inviting and then disinviting, then reinviting, uh, with an apology to a transgender group that mocks the Catholic faith? If we were scoring this as a baseball game, I would qualify it as an unforced error. This was absolutely self-inflicted by the Dodgers franchise. Regardless of whether you think it's right or wrong, the sheer execution of extending the invitation to a controversial, by, arguably by design, uh, organization, then rescinding it, then extending it again, it's become a circular firing squad. They're absolutely taking on fire from every direction. If there's a clear loser in this, if you can even categorize it that way, it's it's the Los Angeles Dodgers and specifically their PR department. I think there'll probably be a house clearing at the end of the season. Yeah, hey, Doug, I'm curious about this one. If a player wanted to sit out the game tonight, you know, in protest of the decision, would they be allowed to do so? Curious about that, you know, because you're a sport agent, as we know, and you work on these contracts. Um, would they be allowed right. to do that? Well, see, that's a great question. And, and really what we've seen, going back to last season, 2022, the Tampa Bay Rays refused to wear a Pride Night jersey on principle, but mostly the players stood on the fact that it ran contra to their religious beliefs. This year, beginning in March, we saw the same thing across the NHL. Foreign players said, absolutely not. This does not align with my religious beliefs. I can be, I can either support gay rights or be indifferent toward gay rights, but that doesn't mean I have to go all the way over to, to arguably promoting it through these pride-centric jerseys and, and stick tape. And so they pushed back, and then NHL one by one acquiesced to, to, to the player demands. Now fast forward to, to earlier this year, to May, and, and, and prior to that, MLB players started to push back as well. Not the, late, not the least of which was Clayton Kershaw, an absolute first ballot Hall of Famer who said, this runs absolutely contra to, to my faith-based beliefs. This has nothing to do with gay rights. This has nothing to do with broader acceptance and inclusion. This has everything to do with the fact that, that this, this organization 
is using religion or, or quote unquote religion, the, 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 the Catholic garb, specifically the nuns, to, to perversely promote their purpose. This is not in line with my beliefs and, I'm, and I refuse to stand by it. And it created an absolute rock in the pond in terms of the ripple effects across the league. And so now what we're seeing is the MLB quietly sent out a mandate instructing teams to pull the pride jerseys. So don't send the players out on the field with the, with the rainbow flag oriented jerseys and all but two franchises, the Dodgers and the San Francisco Giants have pulled it. And on that same end of the scale, the only team that has never in 20 years done a pride night is the Texas Rangers. And so we're seeing on a national scale the pushback, not to, to, to gay rights and inclusion, but the messaging. Target has lost, gosh, at this point, $15 billion. Bud Light has lost 25% of their sales, more than $27 billion, and they're no longer the number one selling beer in the country. It's not the idea of inclusion. It's the idea of the messaging and the way that some people, many people, feel as though it's being forced on them. And, and the Dodgers and MLB as a whole have to be receptive and, and really take a closer read on that or they're going to lose fan share as well. Doug, we have about a minute left or so, but what do you think the fallout's going to be here for the Dodgers? I mean, we know there's protests taking place, you know, outside the stadium tonight because of what's going on uh, with this group that they're honoring. Yeah, you know, it's hard to tell, number one, because the, the news cycle moves so fast and few people can remember the, the front page story of Monday of last week, let alone what it's going to look like a, a week from now. But in those two examples I just gave, right, InBev, which owns Bud Light, as well as Target, we've seen qualifiable, quantifiable evidence of the brand damage. And when we're talking billions of dollars, this is not a short-term brand hit, but rather a long-lasting brand hangover, if you will. And for the Dodgers, I don't know. When you, when you step back and look at the demographics and the psychographics, Los Angeles, I believe, has the highest Catholic population in the country. It also, from an MLB standpoint, has the largest Hispanic population, which are traditionally Catholic by faith. And so I don't know that this was a calculated move. You know, in the context of measure twice, cut once, I don't know that the execution and the ideation of this was really well thought out. And, and perhaps that's evidenced by the invite, uninvite, invite again. Now, they're, they're really losing on all fronts. And 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 I, I'm sorry for them as an organization, but, you know, I, who I really feel for, frankly, are, are the players that are put between a rock and a hard place, no pun intended. And they're the ones that have the microphones shoved in their face saying, what do you think about this? Should you do it? Should you not do it? Because they're going to be castigated on, on either turn. And I think it's unfair to the players. Fans have a choice whether or not to go to the game, whether to watch it. The club obviously made their choice and then unmade it and then made it again. But the players are really getting the short end of the stick on this. And, and, I, and I'm proud of those that stick to their guns and can articulate their message and, and really align with their beliefs, however they may fall. Well, Doug, we always appreciate having you on. And thank you so much for weighing in. Thanks again. Thank you, guys. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including a stately study. We review the states that are the most and least respectful of religious freedom and a reaction to the final day of the U.S. Bishops Spring Assembly. Well, the Supreme Court blocked a measure that would have banned abortion after around six weeks of pregnancy. The court was split in a 3-3 decision, keeping abortion legal in the state for up to 20 weeks of pregnancy for now. Republican Governor Kim Reynolds has expressed disappointment in the ruling. Well, Anu Sadi takes a look at how friendly U.S. states are to religious nonprofit organizations. The Napa Legal Institute released the findings in its first annual Faith and Freedom Index. The report examines ways the 50 states and Washington, D.C. protect freedoms for faith-based groups. At the top of the list, Alabama and Texas, while Michigan and Nevada had the lowest overall rating. And we go now to Mary Margaret Beecher, Napa Legal Institute Vice President and executive director. Mary Margaret, great to be with you today. Uh, first off, tell us a little bit more about the Faith and Freedom Index and the criteria and methodology used in compiling this list. Thanks. Thanks for hosting me. Um, I'm excited to talk about the index. As you mentioned, this is an unprecedented index. We looked at each state from the perspective of a faith-based nonprofit, um, and we separated to, uh, our factors into two categories regulatory freedom and religious freedom, because these are the two categories that really define day-to-day -day operations for a faith-based nonprofit. 
And within those categories, we set objective criteria and just considered whether the different laws in a state burden or support the um, formation and operations of faith-based nonprofits. Let's talk about the findings now. Um, as we mentioned, Alabama and Texas uh, scored the highest on the index. What made those two states stand out? Alabama and Texas stood out because they both combined um, regulatory efficiency, so, so minimal red tape, with clear and unambiguous protections for religious freedom. And in this litigious era, those clear protections are critical for faith-based nonprofits, because if they're, they cannot be certain they can operate in accordance with their sincerely held religious beliefs, that uncertainty can really be um, a complete um, block to their progress and can really detract from their mission. Um, Mary Margaret, as for the states that were at the bottom of the list, what are the major issues there and what ways do you think that they can improve? I think what we saw when the states at the bottom of the list was a combination of either negligence, just in the sense that they, they haven't thought about the experience of faith-based nonprofits as a legislative priority, or, um, or even unfriendliness to these organizations. Um, so for example, in Michigan, um, it's not clear that a faith-based employer can even consider faith commitment in hiring criteria without receiving special permission from the government. Um, that's obviously a problem for a faith-based nonprofit. Um, and then another issue is just clear, um, making the regulatory burdens a little bit more straightforward. So in a state like Wisconsin, um, according to our calculations, an, a nonprofit could spend as much as 20% of its revenue um, just to satisfy basic reporting requirements in the state. Mary Margaret, we have probably about a minute left or so, but I'm curious, you know, what happens next uh, with this study? Do you disseminate this information to various groups and lawmakers? Yes. Yeah, so the index launch is just the beginning. We hope that this facilitates a conversation between lawmakers um, and coalitions of allied organizations, supporters of religious, religious liberty, to improve the landscape in which faith-based nonprofits operate. Um, this will be re-released every year, so we plan to track progress, and we hope that the index will be a, a tool that facilitates cooperation and ultimately results in a better environment for faith-based nonprofits to do the work that they do so well, um, meeting the humanitarian needs of our communities, providing moral formation, providing spiritual new renewal, and responding to some of the damage that we've seen secularism cause um, already in our era. Well, Mary Margaret, great to be with you, and thank you so much for coming on and explaining all this to us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, focus on the faith, a report from Florida on the final day of the USCCB Spring Assembly, plus a closer look at the church in Germany. It is the final day of the USCCB Spring Assembly in Orlando, Florida. And as they wrapped up, the bishops discussed some hot button topics, including Catholic health care and outreach to people with disabilities. We go now to Loretta Brown, staff writer for the National Catholic Register, who is in Orlando right now covering the meetings for us. Loretta, great to have you back on. So what were some of the highlights from today and what stood out the most for you? Well, hello from Orlando, Tracy, and today was kind of a busy final session for the bishops. A couple of things that, that definitely stood out were the discussions on the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care workers, as well as a, discuss a discussion of a revision of the pastoral statement for disabilities. And the bishops just had kind of robust discussions surrounding those issues, certainly some sensitive, you know, cultural hot button topics, particularly with the directives regarding regarding, you know, uh, health care because of, of addressing gender dysphoria, kind of incorporating their doctrinal note from March into that, um, which talks about, you know, gender dysphoria and a proper response with the understanding of the dignity of the human person and church teaching on that matter while still being, you know, obviously sensitive to the issues that people face. And Loretta, also, um, can you tell us about the discussions on the pastoral statement on persons with disabilities in the life of the church? And why does that document, why does it need to be updated? 
Yeah, so, so it was interesting when that discussion began. They, they went ahead with a voice vote and, and advanced that as well. And the reason um, that was initially just seemed apparent was um, they brought up it's, it's actually been 45 years since since a revision and so you know especially I think people in this in this area of care for those with disabilities who have these um, you know persons with disabilities in their in their families in their everyday life know that so much has changed um, even in the past five years you know in terms of you know increased diagnoses increased understanding of mental illnesses versus um, you know other kinds of, of disabilities and the accommodations there and the even the language surrounding the issue and this was the bishops had again like kind of a robust discussion on on those elements as well of you know we need to update the language we need to update um, you know this statement to, to sort of acknowledge these distinctions of you know, these different increased diagnoses I think it was raised you know addressing concerns of, of family members of, of people with autism as autism diagnoses have been on the rise and um, so just understanding, you know, how much has changed and also just the recognition that the church really, you know, persons with disabilities are, are a big part of the church and they need, that needs to be reflected in the pastoral statement. That needs to be recognized and up to date with, with the best information. And Loretta, uh, quickly before I let you go, I understand the bishops also discussed World Youth Day uh, that's taking place, as we know, in August in Portugal. What more can you tell us about that? Yeah, so that was an, an update we received um, from those kind of involved in organizing World Youth Day um, from the U.S. side of things. And it sounds like they're going to have a big turnout up from, from the World Youth Day in Panama. I believe the number was 26,000 registered pilgrims, which is exciting to consider. They also talked about, you know, synodality is a word that keeps coming up um, <laughs> among the bishops in light of kind of the Pope's emphasis on that. But they discussed for, for World Youth Day how there will be dialoguing with bishops. Well, Loretta, thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate it. Loretta Brown, staff writer for the National Catholic Register. Thank you again. And finally tonight, Catholic officials from Germany recently held a conference at the Vatican on ways to show our Catholic faith to the rest of the world. The EWTN Vatican Bureau journalist Rudolf Gehrig spoke with one of the participants to find out more while also receiving an update on the state of the church in Germany. Father Weimann, uh, can you tell us more about this symposium? The symposium is on popular piety. Popular piety is a concrete expression of faith. So we are living and facing a crisis of faith. For that reason, popular piety is so important. What is popular piety in concrete is, for example, if you pray the rosary in a family, and, or if you consecrate yourself to Our Lady, or if you pray at home, or if you participate in a procession. All these are signs of a popular piety. And you can, through these acts of piety, receive certain graces. And they're very important for the faithful today. How is the situation of the church in Germany after all the news we heard recently? The situation of the church in Germany is very delicate. They're like two, I would call them parties almost. On one side, you have functionaries. They work for the church and they're paid by the church, but they do not identify anymore with the doctrine of the church. And this causes a tremendous uh, tension within the situation or within the, 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 among the faithful. And the faithful, the, the real faithful ones who believe in God, they intensify in these days also. So they do more adoration, they pray to Our Lady and so forth. For that reason also we organize this Congress in order to encourage them to keep up this and to give them some guidelines so to increase in their piety and in their relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not that long away since Pope Benedict passed away. How are his teaching still inspiring you? Pope Benedict was a cooperator of truth. So he himself considered him to cooperate with the truth. So for that reason, his theology will always remain a source of inspiration for everyone who looks out for the truth. And uh, Pope Benedict wrote in 1970 an article where he was asked to describe the situation of the Church of the Future very interesting thing. He said, I'm not a prophet, but then he goes on. He says, the church of the future will be reduced church, a smaller church. We will lose our privileges. We will lose many, many things, many institutions, but it will be a purified church, a church purified and renewed in Jesus Christ. And I think this is 
about to happen step by step, even though we're now facing this difficult situation. And then also I think Pope Benedict's theology is going to make a great contribution. And we thank Rudolf Gehrig for this report. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.